Thanks for staying up later. We're with the producer of Saturday Night Live and the creator, really, of the program, Lorne Michaels. Uh, we go back to the mid-70s when the show first hit air. When did the idea first strike you? And to what other programs or concepts would you give credit? Complicated question. Um, I think the idea had always sort of... Uh, the idea was probably, to the extent that it was formed as an idea, was much more generational. I think it was that the kind of things that were making people my age laugh just weren't on television at that time. Or if they were, they were on for a very brief period and then taken off. And so I think the feeling was that if we ever got a chance to do what was already popular in movies and in clubs and in records on television, then it would be successful. I don't think it was the format that we uh, inherited, we inherited from The Tonight Show. We still have the same format as The Tonight Show, which is basically nine seven-minute acts, and, uh, and uh, uh, I believe it's 18 minutes of commercials. So time-wise, you have the same format as The Tonight Show, exactly, but in, ev yeah. in every other way. In every other way, I think we're, uh, uh, it, well, in, in a lot of ways we're different. I think we, they had sort of cleared the tradition of, uh, of what you could do in late night, or of late night being a separate uh, time on television, in the sense that when I was growing up and I would watch uh, Jack Parr and then later Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show, it always seemed to me that, they, that a different standard was at work, that it was a different time and that you could say different things and that it was more informal, more casual, mm -hmm. and occasionally naughty and more, um, you know, just more startling in, in the things that they did. It was, it, 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 particularly in the 60s, it was much more shocking or, or sure. perceived to be much more yeah. shocking. No question that in increments they moved further and further away from the mainstream. But yeah. I, I don't think ever in the history of network television there's been such a quantum leap at one point as what Saturday Night Live represented. Well, I, I think what happened with us was that uh, once, uh, and Dick Ebersol, who, who, as you know, uh, worked on this show as well, um, was uh, played a, a very big part in this, which was that what uh, I, I always describe the show pretty much the same way, in, in, uh, as experimental, and we'd sort of find it on the air, and uh, I knew what all the elements I wanted were in, in the sense of a repertory company, and and young comedians and a certain kind of music that wasn't sort of uh, popular yet on television and uh, short films and a different host every week and, um, and live. And I think that once, it was de once that was accepted and once uh, for economic reasons it was determined that it would be live, that meant that there was no pilot. The auditions were held in August of 74, is that right? Well, uh, no. There was a big uh, open August audition 75. at 75, okay. Yeah, I, the, uh, Gilda, I knew early on. I wanted because I'd work, I, I I knew her from Toronto and Danny as well. Um, although getting Danny uh, uh, on was a harder uh, uh, thing because of uh, his Canadian citizenship and uh, uh, and also because uh, although it all seems uh, because it's now called a format and the show looks as if it was designed that way. Uh, every week it was changing. What, what I knew was that if I got, I was hired April 1st, uh, and uh, I, was, I asked for and, and got th uh, three months to put together the group. And I didn't know what roles most people would be playing. Uh, both Chevy and Garrett were hired as writers. Uh, uh, Lorraine I'd worked with uh, uh, on the Lily Tomlin specials I'd done. You were tentative, though, about Belushi, right? Because, n not because of talent, but personally he made you uncomfortable. Not, not, not so much made me uncomfortable. I thought he was trouble, I believe is the, ex the exact word I used at the time. Um, trouble not so much in the, uh, 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 not, not in, the, in, the, in the way that later turned out uh, uh, to be trouble. Uh, John, pr John was the kind of person that if he gave you his word on anything, he sort of lived up to it. He was uh, very solid that way and very clear about loyalty and, uh, and giving it everything each time. I had my meeting with John and... Uh, the first thing he said to me was, uh, I don't do television, you know. And since I'd been working in television at that point for uh, eight years or nine years, uh, I said, well, I wouldn't ask you to do anything that, uh, he just caught me at the wrong, it was the exact wrong way to lead with me. Yeah. I mean, it was difficult enough to be dealing with a, an attitude that was like, you know, it was in the sort of give me a break category. I mean, you don't do television right, then why are you here? Well, but he, what, he was let, what he was trying to do in his way was to let me know that the honor uh, of, of uh, that this was an honor in the sense that 
what he'd heard about me and the kind of television I was going to do and that I had done and what I was fighting for. He wanted to be part of it. The time that Richard Pryor yeah. uh, hosted the show, and I think that's the one that gave rise to the samurai thing. Wasn't that the first time yeah. that, uh, yeah. that, yes. that they did the samurai deal? Yes. Um, the censors wanted a five-second delay because they were afraid of what of what they were, they were very worried about Richard's uh, 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 monologue and uh, I said they said well how do you know what he's gonna do and I said well he gave me his word And they said and you're gonna take his word and I said uh, of course and and so what happened was that created a, a certain sense of distrust that was already there probably anyway in Richard's mind about the network anyway mm -hmm. the ironic part about this and I won't avoid this story I'll come back to it is that the show was so successful and was repeated three times within that year that by the following season, Richard had a primetime series on NBC, but that's how fast things change within, uh, within television. But um, Richard was staying at a hotel and he was uncomfortable at the office. So John had done, I, was, I, I knew him best, so I was working with him on what was going to be in the show. And John had done the Samurai as his audition piece. He'd done Toshiro Mifune. Uh, it was suggested that uh, we do this uh, Richard, uh, John came over to Richard's hotel room and did the Samurai for him, and then out of that we shaped, uh, Tom Schiller actually wrote it as Samurai Hotelier. And I remember in the, in the first season, at the end of the first uh, season, uh, Danny and uh, John drove cross country, and John and I hooked up later in that summer, and he said that he didn't, he had said by the end of the season he never wanted to do the Samurai again. We'd done it in the last show, Buck mm -hmm. Henry show. Again, we'd done it, so we'd done it three times. He said he didn't want to do it ever again. Uh, but in driving cross country, people had mentioned it over and over again. And he said, maybe we should do the Samurai again the next season. And that was the beginning of consciousness. We suddenly were getting mail, and we were suddenly, people were being hit on within the cast and being told, I love it when you do this, or I love it when you do that. And, and that was the beginning of the sort of the notion that, you, that hit characters would come back. At the time, we, it wasn't in any way the intention. The intention was that we'd write a different show every week bi built around the host, which was uh, the only element of the show that was mm -hmm. going to you know, uh, change every week. At some point, you said that what you hoped would get across, and eventually this is what came across, was that the network had shut down, or maybe some of these executives were bound and gagged in a closet, and these madmen had taken the network over for 90 minutes. Well, I thought that if we weren't judged immediately, I think it's very important. I, I tried to create the impression that we'd snuck onto the air. And I always felt, I still feel this today, that, uh, that what, n what uh, hurts comedy shows the most, or at least this kind of comedy show, is expectations. And so uh, when you're trying to change things or present a different way of looking at things or a different style, it's best to let people discover. There were times when Saturday Night Live cast members spoofed their own real or perceived lives and real or perceived excesses. Yes. There, there was a bit where uh, Belushi is visiting the graves and he's kind of, kind of uh, musing about this one's life and that one's life moving from tombstone to tombstone. And then in the end he does this kind of Zorba dance. Because I'm a dancer, yeah. yeah. Tom Schiller did that film, which is a brilliant film. Why me? John, more than anyone, didn't want to disappoint the writing staff. Uh, there were times in which, uh, because he would be in a fight, with, uh, say, Ann Beats and Rosie uh, Schuster for other reasons, because Judy was working on a book with them and he was upset that, for whatever reasons, he Just would for not want to. Yeah. These are Saturday Night Live writers These are Saturday and Judy Night is Live Belushi's writing. wife. Exactly. And, um, and he would not want to do certain pieces by, there, there was a time in which John had a thing about playing drag. He would not work in drag. He thought it was the lowest form of comedy and he, uh, would never descend to that. So he must have loved Garrett Morris's work. Well, uh, or, uh, and, and he disliked the English, I must say. He disliked the, the Pythons because they were always dressing as women. Yeah. He thought that, uh, that it was like, he just had a thing about it. So when we wanted him to do Elizabeth Taylor, there was a writer on the show who was having a difficult time. And so the people who wrote the piece had, to, had presented it as if it was somebody else had written it who was struggling and who was a friend of John's. And so he did it, but he did it because it was a friend in trouble, not because he thought it would be funny doing Elizabeth Taylor uh, choking on a chicken bone. Thank you so much, Liz. It's been a real treat for me to have you. True or false that there was a show where Belushi, for whatever reasons, whether drugs were part of it or just hard partying or whatever at that stage, he was so sick, he said, I really, I, I can't go on. And so much of the show was pegged to him that you almost had to push him on 
and the NBC doctor was saying, this guy is really in bad shape. It was Kate Jackson's show, and uh, John was playing Fred Silverman. This was in the fourth season, and <sighs> there was a, uh, the whole show, the, the, the writing idea in it was that Fred Silverman would come over with great fanfare to run NBC after tr making ABC number, number one, was, was still, uh, was, was not having the same kind of success at NBC, and that he was, in effect, a sort of, uh, 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 that he was still working for ABC, was the joke. And uh, so mm -hmm. all of his ideas, uh, and that Kate Jackson, who was in Charlie's Angels at the time, was there to get in touch with uh, Fred Silverman. So the whole show had to do with this runner with John playing Fred Silverman. And unfortunately, I believe Ron Wood was in town that, that week, and, and John had started to spend, again, uh, with the success of Animal House and... From the Rolling Stones. From the Rolling Stone, yes, of course. And what happened was um, uh, he'd been uh, up very late, and uh, John knew, knew what his responsibility was to the show, and uh, it all sounds terribly glib to talk about it now, but basically I, I was just furious at, uh, at his behavior, and uh, I came in, and, and he had the doctor pretty much where he wanted him in the sense of... Uh, uh, that he was just looking to get out of it, because mostly because he'd been tired, and I'd made it very clear to him that we depended on him that week. And this was one of the last shows he did for us, and I said, uh, the doctor, it was, he was just dreadful at dress rehearsal. And the doctor, I came to the dressing room, and uh, he was lying there, and he had a, a, a hot towel on his uh, forehead. And the doctor said, uh, in a very, very dramatic way, it was not an NBC doctor, um, if you go, you know, uh, uh, he can't go on tonight. And I said, he's going on tonight. Uh, you know, I have a whole show built around this character and him, and he knows it. And John looked at me, you know, uh, in the way that he had of raising an eyebrow and, and sort of looked at me and uh, acknowledged what I was saying. And uh, I said, uh, he said, if, if he goes on, the odds are 50-50, he'll die, which was as dramatic. Uh, his lungs were, were uh, filling up. And I said, because... Uh, probably just because I was angry, I said, well, I can live with those odds. And uh, he, uh, John, just leapt up, got into makeup, and, and I, I wish I could say that he did this incredible performance. He did a, a perfectly average performance. It wasn't one of his best nights, but he understood whenever uh, it was clear what his role was and that people were counting on him, he was very, very solid. It's easy to be self-righteous in yeah. retrospect. So my asking this question, I hope, doesn't imply that because it's such an easy thing to say afterwards. But I would like to get your response. In light of the way he was behaving, it was pretty clear that he was abusing drugs, not just yeah. using them, but even by the definitions that prevailed at that time, he was yeah. abusing drugs. He, w he was consumed by fame to the point of riding around in a limousine sometimes and sticking his head out the window just to see who would recognize him. Uh, Chevy Chase was here a couple of years ago, and and expressed his tremendous admiration for John's talent and his love for him personally, and then said all of us knew he'd become a jerk and he was incorrigible and everything else. In light, right. of, in light of all that, plus other evidence we could cite forever, did you or anybody else around John fail him in some sense? Uh, no. No. I, 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 it's, of course, knee-jerk and reactive on my part to say no, but uh, I think that once when we were... Uh, Danny and, and Chevy and uh, John and myself were in, in uh, a place called Joshua Tree, where, where, where we'd gone for a weekend while we were on the road doing this uh, Beach Boys uh, uh, show. Uh, we were on the road. For, it was a, a summer off, and, and we were doing this documentary on the Beach Boys. And we'd, been, we'd uh, had a barbecue, and uh, John had cooked, because John was the one, the one of us who cooked, and so he... He made, the, you know, he'd fussed about all that stuff. And, and then we'd had beers and, and probably smoked some joints. And it was around 2 o'clock in the morning by the time we, we went to sleep. And in the desert, the sun came up at 5 in the morning. And uh, Danny and I were in rooms. Uh, Danny and John were sharing a room, and I was in the room next to them. And these were tiny little, it was like a little motel. And uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I, I just heard this sound uh and i i struggled to the door because there was a lot of noise mm -hmm. uh, going on and and when i got to the door uh with three hours sleep danny was also at the door and in about the same condition i was in and john was on the diving board and he was doing this dive that he used to do where he would he would jump straight up and then he would hit his ass on the board and then flip into the water and i looked at it and and danny looked at it and and we went 
And Danny said to me, uh, Albanian oak, you know, and I think that's what we thought it was made of. Was Aykroyd the greatest sketch player? Not necessarily the greatest talent, but the greatest sketch player in SNL uh, history? I, I think Phil Hartman is his, is, is his match in, in, in many ways. Uh, Phil does a lot of the same thankless roles that Danny used to do. Uh, Phil's Ed McMahon, uh, 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 to hit on a sore point, is, uh, is I think, breathtaking. I, I, and, and it's a sort of one of those ones where you just know how solid it is because it, it, you never have to worry about how good it's going to be. Danny had the same quality. He could be in the part, as, uh, as we were saying off camera before, Danny, who was eight years younger than Chevy, or actually, I think, now 12 years younger than Chevy, was uh, uh, much always played his father, played John's father, played Gilda's father, played everyone's father when he was 22, 23, when he began on the show. Uh, and so he would always play any authority figure or, and he could do the Norwich Repairman as well. <laughs> it, it broke my heart when Dan left the show. That was what sort of uh, snapped it for me. Uh, there, there were all sorts of complications and lots of reasons and it's not worth going into the whys of it because it was just our time was up. But he was the best at it. In the sense that John and, and uh, uh, Chevy and, and, and Gilda had, and Jane certainly had other, had other, you could see their range, but you could also see what they were great at. Danny was, could do anything. And so, and, and, uh, and also he was a double threat because he was uh, for many years certainly the best writer on the show. So he had, you knew that he could never be appreciated in the same way that say Alec Guinness is an actor's actor and, and that you can watch him in mm -hmm. Kind Hearts and Coronet play and you know an entire family and do it with great dignity and skill and and style and and Danny was to the extent that there's a Saturday night style to the extent that we're something that maybe years from now people will think of us as we brought something Danny uh, in, in, in effect uh, 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 what is the word that I'm searching for uh, uh, shaped it Shaped it, defined it, yeah. Tonight, Lorne Michaels comes back, and we run through a list of performers and sketches on Saturday Night Live, past and present. Hope you'll be with us. Until then, see you later. <laughs>